Tripoli, capital of the desert state of Libya. At dawn, the city slowly awakes. Fishermen return from their nocturnal work at sea, along with their catch. Fresh and tasty, and ready for market. Soon there's much hustle and bustle. Huge fish are manually unloaded from tiny fishing boats. Here, the local marine life has not yet been destroyed by huge fleets of fishing boats. On the quay, the charm of the Orient is plain to see, as it is throughout the entire city, an exotic corner of North Africa. This ancient city is inhabited by hard-working people, a fascinating place that is gradually embracing the Western way of life. The fishermen have taken their catch to the nearby market, but various merchants ply their trade in typical Arabian fashion. A fine display highlights the richness of the region's marine life, a source of great pride among the local merchants. Last night's catch was bountiful indeed, and the sale of the fish promises a good deal. The old town is known as the Medina. With its narrow lanes and squat buildings, it's a combination of Arabian, North African and Mediterranean cultures. The joie de vivre of the local people is obvious and music and dance are part of their daily lives. In antiquity, the city was called Oia. It was one of the three cities of Tripolitania, and in Roman times, this section of the coast contained the trading towns of Leptis Magna and Sabrata. When this region was conquered in the 7th century by the Arabs, they made Oia their capital city and gave it total autonomy. Thus, Oya was the only one of the three ancient metropoli that remained inhabited and thus continued to prosper. It had palaces and mosques, and several churches. Today, it also contains a number of impressive modern buildings. Since 1963, Tripoli has been the capital of the great socialist Libyan Arab People's Republic of Chamaharija, the state of the masses. The old town is encircled by a large wall. It also contains a souk that was almost fully abandoned following the Great Revolution, as private trading was then forbidden. When this law was abolished in 1988, the souk once again sprang to life. Basic goods are offered for sale in the people's supermarkets. Following the age-old tradition, merchants and producers of special goods gather together. Here, arts and crafts have much importance. The ancient skill of forging metal over huge open fires is still practiced and the result is fine copper bowls. A number of workshops produce a variety of domestic goods. The smoky, noisy lanes of the souk are a good place from which to observe local craftsmen at work. 
This helps prospective customers to judge the quality of the finished product. Elsewhere, fruit and vegetables are available, and a wonderful array of fresh fruit is offered for sale each day, with spices adding to the exotic aromas. In the colourful souk, there is no pressure to buy. Indeed, the merchants are extremely helpful. Many shops sell cloth and numerous textiles that highlight the local culture. The triumphal arch of Marcus Aurelius is located at the exact centre of this ancient city and the original man-made surface beneath the arch is still in good condition. In 163 AD, the triumphant victory of Roman Emperor Julius Caesar over the Namibian king was celebrated in the usual way, and the city, plus the newly founded region of Africa Nova, fell to Rome. Remains of numerous stone reliefs feature various motifs of both the victorious and the defeated, plus weaponry, fantastic beings and deities, as well as glorifying inscriptions. Layers of debris make it possible to see how much the surrounding city has gradually been elevated over time. The Karamanli Palace has been lovingly restored and now contains a museum. This splendid building was assembled at the end of the 18th century. A guide is available to explain the long history of this building. He leads us through the splendid rooms that are accessible from an inner courtyard. Once the former owner, Yusuf Karamanli, and his many wives walked through these shadowy arcades. The walls are decorated with precious tiles that indicate the immense wealth of the former dynasty. The Karamanlis were followed by the Ottomans, and later the palace served as the seat for the Tuscan consulate. Finally, it was transformed into a museum. Various well-furnished rooms take visitors back to bygone times and all the atmosphere of a golden age. A display of historic clothing indicates the various social groups and professions of a time when the local pashas of the Karamanli dynasty ruled over the city. A small fountain in a cool inner courtyard is a romantic sight. In the surrounding area, time has certainly not stood still. The traditional work of the city tailors is now performed with hot irons and modern sewing machines. Diligent and skillful hands create expensive bespoke tailoring under the constant view of the benevolent looking head of state. In 1969, Muammar al-Gaddafi was appointed leader of the revolution. All unwelcome foreigners were driven out of the country. Strict religious principles were adopted and the consumption of alcohol was prohibited. Since then, Colonel Gaddafi has ruled over the People's Republic of Libya as head of state and commander-in-chief of the army. And his subjects are extremely loyal to him. Due to its immense deposits of oil, Libya is the richest country in Africa, 
with a population of both Libyans and Berbers. Modern Tripoli is undergoing constant development. Contemporary architecture is everywhere. Skyscrapers that contain offices and apartments have been built on the periphery of the city. The economic sanctions that the USA imposed on Libya in 1986 due to the country's suspected support of terrorism ended some years ago. At that time, some sections of Tripoli were heavily bombed. Today, Libya's peaceful relationship with the West has been restored and with more than a million inhabitants, Tripoli is now becoming an important center of trade in the international marketplace. On the site of the St. George Church, several centuries ago, a number of Christians were incarcerated in a Turkish prison during the rule of Pasha al-Sakizli. The city's last remaining Orthodox church is dedicated to Holy George. He was a soldier of the Roman Empire who refused to persecute the Christians and was put to death. Today, this is the residence of the Metropolit, the religious leader of Libya's Orthodox Church. The liturgies of the Byzantine services have no musical accompaniment, only male voices. The altar room is strictly men only. One of the problems of the prohibition of alcohol in this Islamic state is that priests require dark red wine for the liturgy. The interior of this Orthodox church is dominated by icons. Its windows to eternity are not painted, but written, unique works of art. Orthodox Christians believe that during the Holy Liturgy, heaven opens up and all of its saints and angels descend into the church. A face-to-face -face encounter with the divine. The icons describe various impressions of these heavenly events. Around 70 kilometers west of Tripoli, and also located on the Mediterranean coast, are the remains of the ancient trading town of Sabrata. Its theater has been rebuilt and is still an impressive structure. It dates back to the second century AD and was built by the Romans who came here after the Phoenicians gave the city a completely new appearance. It could accommodate up to 5,000 people. This amazing treasure lay hidden beneath the desert sands until it was discovered by a group of Italian archaeologists. The old capital of the former Tripolitania experienced both its cultural and economic high season after it became a part of the newly founded Roman province. It was while ruled by the Roman emperors that the city's most important buildings were constructed, and from which today only these impressive ruins have survived. Under Antonius Pius, Sabrata became a colonia, a title that gave the city a prominent place among other Roman cities. Several baths, including the sea baths that are situated close to the coast, indicate the luxurious living standards of those ancient times.
trade with the farmers of the surrounding area assured the inhabitants of Sabrata a comfortable lifestyle. Several of its citizens enjoyed much wealth. The city even had its own trading center in the harbor town of Antica Ostia that was part of Rome. But the decline of the Roman Empire brought with it the downfall of this city whose fate was closely linked with the Romans. The Arab rulers who followed subsequently chose Oia as their metropolis and the city fell into oblivion. Back in the old city of Tripoli, a new day awakes. The city gradually comes to life and demonstrates why it has become an important metropolis. Numerous bakeries are surrounded by the smell of freshly baked bread that fills the narrow lanes and tempts early morning appetites to begin the day with a tasty treat. Most of Tripoli's bakeries are equipped with modern equipment. Libya moves with the times. Children also enjoy breakfast. A new day dawns. And the pearl of the Mediterranean provides us with even more surprises. The Green Square, Asaha al Qadra, is situated in the center of the city, a place where both local people and tourists congregate. Large military parades also take place here. In 1969, the Green Revolution began in Green Square. It was here that Colonel Gaddafi spoke out to the suppressed population. A large castle flanks the northern section of the square. This huge building was built on Roman ruins in the 11th and 12th centuries. The former royal palace has at various times been occupied by Spanish, Turkish and Italian settlers, until it finally became a museum with the aid of UNESCO. Green Square and its large fountain supported by four horses divides the old town from this district that was once favored by Libya's former Italian colonialists. In the 1930s, they created their very own world here. And now espresso and cappuccino are enjoyed throughout Libya. Tripoli has had a dramatic past and there's no better place in which to learn of this than the National Museum, the Yamaharia Museum. It contains a number of prehistoric cave paintings. And many works of art. Following its renovation, it has become one of the most modern museums on the African continent. On four floors, the history of Libya gradually unfolds from Paleolithic times until the present day. The various exhibits make it easy to follow the country's history. Exhibits are divided into prehistoric, Byzantine, Roman, and Islamic times. And recent Libyan history also has its place here. Numerous wall reliefs and stone heads from the great Roman epoch feature among the museum's most precious exhibits. These great ancient treasures of bygone cultures add further to the mystique of this exotic desert state.
Here, history comes to life and ancient ruins tell their own amazing story. Mosques are the prayer houses of the Islams. One of the most beautiful is the Gurgi Mosque that was donated by a merchant, Yosef Gurgi, who originated from Georgia. He amassed a great fortune during the Karamanli dynasty. He gave thanks to God with this splendid building whose interior is decorated with colorful tiles. The imposing Medan al Jezayir Mosque was once a Catholic church. Around the church is all the hustle and bustle of the old town. In Libya, belief in God and his prophet is part of daily life. And several times a day, the faithful come to pray. Almost the entire population is dedicated to the state religion, Sunnite Islam. Strict adherence to Islamic law is closely observed by the state. Since the middle of the 19th century, the Senussi Brotherhood has played an important role here. Its aim is religious renewal and the separation of political influence from Europe. The oldest Muslim place of worship in Tripoli is the al Naka Mosque. In the beginning of the 16th century, it was badly damaged by the Spanish and a hundred years later, it was renovated by Safar Dai. The original prayer hall dates back to its foundation in around 1200 AD and its 36 supporting pillars came from the ancient city of Oya. Our final journey goes east to one of the most impressive ruins of antiquity, the legendary city of Leptis Magna. a unique ancient metropolis, a fine treasure trove on Libya's Mediterranean coast. The third city of Tripolitania has an extraordinary history. Phoenicians, Carthaginians, and Numidians once ruled over this place until the Romans arrived. However, its forced integration into the Roman Empire did not bring economic stagnation, but instead a splendid epoch of prosperity. The former Leptis became the Great Leptis. This was the birthplace of a Roman Emperor, Septimius Severus. Septimus favoured his hometown and permitted it to be free of tax, so its inhabitants gained immense wealth. After Rome and Carthage, Leptis Magna was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, as is evident by these impressive excavation sites. During its high season, many splendid buildings appeared. Several monumental buildings were erected that were outclassed only by those in Rome. However, following the city's high season came its sad decline. A decline caused by the hostilities of local tribes and the Vandals, as well as a number of devastating earthquakes. The once magnificent Leptis Magna was subsequently abandoned. Tripoli, along with the historic towns of the former Tripolitania, is one of the most spectacular places of ancient culture in North Africa. The heritage of an advanced civilization located on the edge of the Sahara. <laughs> 